Robert Frost long ago wrote this beautiful poem set to music. Thank you so much for that today. It's just really moving and stunning. The Bible tells us that there are two roads. There is the wide road and the narrow road. The wide road is the way of the crowd. It's the easier way. It's the way of selfishness and greed and personal entitlement. I want what I want. I want it now. And what I want is what matters the most. The narrow way is the way of the Holy Spirit. It's the way of following the way of Jesus. It's the way of loving our neighbor, loving our enemy, praying for those who persecute us. It's the way of compassion and kindness and generosity. The way of the crowd, the wide ray way, does not see those that we do not want to see. Just last night there was, some of you saw on television, a little feature about a Harvard uh, law school graduate. How many of you saw that last night? A few of you may have. Who began to say hello and to thank the service workers in the cafeteria at the law school, the one who took out the trash, the one who cleaned the counter, the one who brought out the food. And they started talking among themselves, what's his gig? And finally somebody asked him his story. And he grew up uh, take, uh, at working for the city, uh, uh, collecting garbage along with his dad. He came from humble beginnings, and he said, we do not see the unseen among us. So he started a nonprofit to celebrate the service workers in the com community. He chose the narrow way. It's harder to see those we do not want to see. The Holy Spirit makes all things possible. Please pray with me. Great Spirit, you have lit upon each of us a flame to serve you in all that we do. Ignite your flame and help us to burn brightly for you by loving our neighbor, all our neighbors, those who live next door, and those who are invisible. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Open our eyes to see and our ears to hear your word among us this day. In Christ's name, amen. Welcome to Pentecost. It's the birthday of the church. Some years we have big red banners coming in and we have dancing down the aisles and everybody's making a big hoopla about the birthday party. If you've ever lived in the Midwest or inland somewhere, there's big helium balloon bouquets right here attached to the pulpit. But here the seagulls would choke to death, so we don't do that. And Sunday school kids often have a birthday cake with candles, and they talk about how the church was born on Pentecost, and they blow out the candles, and they eat the cake. It's a powerful day. It's a powerful day of story about when the Holy Spirit came down upon the followers of Jesus and filled them with the power to change the world. There's no balloons or banners or cake today, even though I like cake. Everyone, every family tells stories. We all have stories to tell. Stories of God's blessings, stories of how God saw us through those terrible times. God is seeing us through terrible times still and brought us safely to the other side. Inexplicably, how could it be? We're people of story, of sorrow and of hope. Today we share two such stories. We're all dressed up in red today to recall the power of God's Holy Spirit that descended into the world on that day with tongues of fire, uniting on Pentecost diverse peoples from all over the world. Pentecost reversed an ancient myth you may have heard about in Sunday school about the Tower of Babel when humans scattered all over the face of the earth, no longer able to easily understand one another. And now through Christ, all peoples reunite by God's power. As Jesus left this earthly realm, he sent the disciples on ahead to Jerusalem to wait for the outpouring of God's spirit that would unify all humanity once again with love, the only thing that can. On that day... Despite the diversity of human languages, all gathered and experienced the mighty works of God, understanding one another and embracing one another as beloved children of God. Then the second story follows. 
as the fired up disciples then went on out into the world with a powerful story that would change the course of humanity, God called Paul, a devout Jew, to do the same. You may recall that he previously had persecuted what grew to be powerful communities committed to, to God by following the way of Jesus after Paul's lightning bolt, bolt spiritual transformation blinded thrown from his horse, God filled him with power. And then he shared the story of God through Christ to those outside the Jewish faith who had never heard of it. This same spirit that spoke to the disciples on Pentecost now spoke to the people of Rome. The story continues then for all of us, named and adopted in perpetuity as beloved children of God. So this morning, we're going to take just a little bit of time to reflect on the power of God's spirit that contrary to the ways of the world, defines life that is more than hope, more hope than despair, more healing than suffering, and more love than hate, more hope than despair, despite what it looks like, more healing than suffering, despite what we read, more love than hate. What happened on that birthday 2,000 years ago is described by poet Gerard Manley Hopkins who wrote that the world is charged with the grandeur of God. It will flame out shining like shook foil. God's glory exploded into the world on Pentecost, the Jewish holiday also called Shavat, which came 50 days after Passover, which means that we are now 50 days post-Easter on this celebration of Pentecost. At this annual festival, faithful Jews from every nation, including the disciples, gathered in Jerusalem as they did every year to commemorate the reception of the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. Now, Mount Sinai was shrouded with fire and smoke. And now the house where the disciples gathered appeared to fill with wind and fire. The Bible tells us that after Jesus rose from the dead, something spectacular happened at this Pentecost festival that changed everything that followed. When the day of Pentecost had come, the scripture says the first followers of Jesus were all together in one place. And all of a sudden, a sound came from heaven, like a strong wind filling the house where the people had gathered. Something like tongues of fire rested on their heads. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them the ability to speak. Many who heard these messages in their own languages were amazed, though others thought the Christians were just drunk. Even though it was only nine o'clock in the morning. This is water, by the way. For early followers of the way, the day of Pentecost shocked them witless. It's not that they weren't expecting something to happen. After all, Jesus had told them to go on ahead to Jerusalem and wait. They just didn't know what it would be like or when it would come. The prophets had told them that the day would come when God would pour out God's own spirit on all kinds of people, filling them with divine power. We may wonder at God's power when we have experienced our own rapidly beating hearts, when the spirit moves us, those God moments when our hair stands on end on the back of our neck. When we're open to it, we sometimes experience something not unlike that moment of both exhilaration and fear. What's going on? Jesus tried to explain what the spirit would be like to the disciples so that when it came upon them, they wouldn't be so terrified. He was patient. Uh, when he talked to them just before his death, the spirit is coming. I won't leave you orphaned. I'll send the advocate to you, the spirit as a mother tries to reassure her child in the middle of a wounded time. But the Spirit didn't come quietly to each disciple in the night as they slept, gently stirring their hearts to faith. 
It was much more like one of these final basketball games that are packed to the hilt, where there's a, but there's a theologian there, Desmond Tutu, or someone else great, and you stand side by side with Christians from every nation, and the roof begins to rattle and shake as if there's a hurricane or a microburst. Your hair stands on end as flames of fire dance on everybody's heads, and you begin to hear and understand a multiplicity of languages, Spanish, Greek, Chinese, from every gathered nation. Jesus prepared and equipped the disciples for this, though they did not know it, to proclaim God's plans for the world and invite all people from that wide path to come into alignment with God's intention for humankind. The legacy of God's spirit loosed in the world empowers all believers together and then those on the narrow way, God scatters us as seeds of hope upon winds of love, planting God's spirit everywhere out in the world. If the disciples had only known that after three short years of study with Jesus, they would be called upon to lead the class, they might have paid more attention. And then God captured Paul's attention and by the power of the Holy Spirit at work through him, he captured the attention of those Romans eager to follow God's promised future. He spoke into their struggles with God's hope that as beloved children of an all-powerful God, their future would be less defined by suffering than by glory, less by shame than by forgiveness. We all suffer. Being Christian does not make us immune from grief and loss and suffering in this world. We're mortal. But we know because of this story, because of our story, because of the narrow way, following the way of Jesus, that suffering is not the end of our story. It is, in the grand scheme of things, temporary, though it hurts deeply. The work of the Spirit makes it possible for us to rise to our feet as the world seems to crumble around us. And it does sometimes, doesn't it? While acknowledging that we humans all do suffer, Paul wrote to the people of Rome that God's power reframes how we think about it. You see, our present sufferings may discourage us, but they're nothing compared to the riches of kingdom life. We'll be talking about evil later this summer in, as part of the series. You'll hear about it next week. As you've all given your ideas of what we might preach about, you'll hear more about evil then that tries to pull us off our path. And you'll discover and you'll hear this summer that the ways of this world have no ultimate hold upon us. God is with us in the struggles of life, and ultimately, those struggles do end. By the power of the Holy Spirit, we pass through them to the other side. We're starving for this good news. So in the midst of whatever we're going through, whatever we're up against, whatever's up against us, but also in the midst of whatever struggle our neighbor is going through, we just had someone working on our home yesterday who lost their home in a fire, did not have any insurance, and someone they loved died in that fire. He too needs really good news. He's now part of the unhoused in this community looking for a place to live, couch surfing from place to place. He had a story to tell and he just wanted us to see him. So this message is not only for us, but for him. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Paul drives home the good news that nothing can separate us from God's love because of God's own giving of his son for us and pouring out his spirit upon us. Indeed, it is God himself who works all things together for our good. Theologian Beverly Gaventa observed harsh circumstances in an individual believer's life. Social realities in the first century Roman world and even cosmic catastrophe will never overcome God's beloved. We are more than conquerors through God who loves us.
There's power in the peace of mind that God promises us through the storms of life. We're profoundly comforted by Romans 8, that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to God's purpose. We can't, therefore, assume that it's only us, right? For all people, for all who are called, for all who are loving and at work in the world. In my lifetime, I've never known a season more in need of God's Holy Spirit than this. Back in May of, 19, or of 2020, at the height of COVID, I preached a Pentecost sermon right here to an entirely empty house except for Phil Long, who snuck in all the way through COVID anyway. We tentatively opened just a week later for confirmation. We prayed then for God's miraculous power to crack open a treatment, a cure, a vaccine for COVID-19 and relief from lonely isolation and long hours caring for those who suffer. We needed God's miraculous power to, to break open the suffering we experienced and God did. We needed then also God's miraculous power to break open the violence. You remember that was a very violent year in our country that takes and breaks our neighbors and our communities, relentlessly disturbing our peace. We pray for that still. Come Holy Spirit, come. We need God's miraculous spirit to rattle the bonds that separate us more today than ever. Even as we affirm here what we believe, that there's more that binds us together than separates us in the love of God, the worship of God, and the service of God, nevertheless, we witness the continual unraveling of civil respect for one another as neighbors. We've labored for decades for liberty and justice for all. We've devolved, nevertheless, from respecting one another to merely tolerating one another to suspicion, to outright disdain. Fortunately, figuring out what God wants does not depend on our getting it right. We're clearly messing it up. We're human. Fortunately, the power of all that was, is, or ever shall be that we call God is at work in this moment, in and through all things, healing, reconciling, creating a force for good, despite our persistent human efforts to mess things up. Once the wind of God's spirit rocks our world, we begin to experience this miraculous power for good already at work, even as the world appears to unravel. Our Pentecost prayers for the unity experienced by those first gathered disciples become more fervent now than at any time, I believe, since the Civil War. This weekend, we remember the fallen who died serving this country. I once asked my father to recall World War II and his arrival in both Hawaii after Pearl Harbor and in Osaka, Japan after the horror of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I asked him why he went there, given that the war was by then over, the truce signed. He said simply that while the war may have been over between nations, the war between nations battled on in the hearts and lives of individuals unwilling to stop hurting one another, including us. Perhaps Jesus came into the world to show us that the war finally is over. God doesn't care much who is right and who is wrong. So he doesn't care so much who owns the most toys or exercises the most power or has the most favorable form of governance in our time. Maybe what matters most to God is the pure pleasure of experiencing how the Holy Spirit burns through us when we are willing to light up this world. The power of God's spirit heals and reconciles every other living thing to itself, to each other, and to the power that uttered it with love. That's the Pentecost story we long to hear. God's way is the enduring way, the hope that will last we don't need red banners and helium balloons and birthday cake, although we may have them next year. <laughs>
So much as we need God's Holy Spirit that shakes heaven and earth so that the former things pass away and the new has come. This is God's Pentecost story. Good news for all beloved followers of the way. The earth is now filled with God's Holy Spirit, charged already with the grandeur of God. We wait expectant of God's promised power. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Shake the world out of its improbable madness. Make all things new, fresh, and possible by your breath. And on that wonderful day, may the power of God's Holy Spirit flame out upon us and upon all people, shining as shook foil. Amen.